Hello, I hope you've been enjoying the South African Innovation Summit so far. We've been excited to have you in our session today. It's about a topic that's close to our heart. It's not just about innovation, but inclusive innovation. Stay with us to find out why this is such an important topic for the African entrepreneurship community, now more than ever. My name is Yvonne Ching, and I work for Bob Inc. I'm deeply passionate about economic empowerment at the last mile, and for the past seven years, I've worked with many entrepreneurs, both businesses and multinational, in tailoring their offering to be more inclusive businesses. Over to my colleague. Hi, my name is Germin Jansen, and I also work for Bob Inc. In the past 10 years, I've been supporting some very exciting product and service innovations for low-income markets. One of the wackiest ones probably being the use of virtual reality to sell toilets. I've lived and worked in various countries around the world, such as Vietnam and Kenya, but today I'm calling from the Netherlands. It's a pleasure to connect with you all. So Garin and I work for Bob Inc which is a not-for-profit organization that wants to connect today's low-income consumers with the dignified choices of tomorrow. With our team of 60 inclusive business professionals, we work with a whole range of companies and partners across 30 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. In 2019, we teamed up with the SICE program to design and deliver an inclusive innovation training package for Southern African entrepreneurs. Through this program, we've trained over 300 individuals, staff of eight innovation support organizations, such as incubators and universities, as well as 20 independent business coaches. When working with this amazing group of people, as always, we've been very much inspired by the power of inclusive innovations, and we learned a lot more about how to better support this group and their ideas. In today's session, We'll share our insights on working with inclusive innovators. We'll also call upon everyone attending this session to help make inclusive innovation more commonplace. To make sure we have your full attention, here's a fun activity to start with. Grab a post-it or a small paper that you can find. Got it? Now put it behind your back and tear the paper to make a perfect pyramid. Does it look something like this? Now tear off the lower part of the pyramid. Which of the two parts is bigger? That's right, the base. The base of the pyramid is a term that we'll be using quite a lot throughout this session. It represents 4 billion people with little cash at hand, yet constituting a 5 trillion global consumer market for entrepreneurs to work with. Thanks, Yvonne. So now that we're all energized, let's start at the beginning and share with you our definition of inclusive innovation. What is it? Inclusive innovation is an entrepreneurial approach for developing products and services for and with people that have been largely excluded by the system. In our case, these are low-income households living at the base of the income pyramid. Yes, the one you just made with a small paper. When we were asked to speak at this event, we realized that inclusive innovation is one of the answers to the theme of the annual Southern Africa Innovation Forum, 2020. For those who don't know what it is, the theme of this year's Innovation Forum, which is what the SA Innovation Summit coincides with, is rethink the system. If you ask us, inclusive innovation is one of the approaches to achieve this. Why? Well, COVID-19 revealed to us the many flaws in how we've been fulfilling even the most basic human needs with the biggest flaw of the system being inequality. As the COVID-19 pandemic took off, we've seen low-income people being hit the hardest across the board. Access to safe and nutritious food, decent work, good health care, affordable financial services, etc., etc. Look inside your own communities and you'll notice that the unemployment rates are going up much faster among lower educated people. And for those living in a shack in an informal settlement, 
it's been so much harder to access knowledge about COVID, but also to get tested and treated. These inequalities between income groups, of course, are not new. And similar examples as the ones I've just shared have always been around. It's just that COVID-19 gives us another wake-up call that we can no longer ignore. And as Winston Churchill mentioned when he was working to form the United Nations, we should never let a good crisis go to waste. So let's work together to rethink the system and use the power of inclusive innovation and entrepreneurship to drive that change. There are so many great examples of inclusive innovators that show us this potential. While many larger companies have taken action to help the most vulnerable communities to withstand the crisis, it's been the startups and local organizations operating at the front line that have been the first to respond and take action. One of the ventures supported by the SIZE2 program, for example, installed more than 2,000 do-it-yourself hand wash stations for shack dwellers in just the first weeks of the lockdown. Another example is a size two project that's using the latest precision agricultural technologies to grow food in the Namibian desert and do that at affordable prices. This reduces the carbon footprint of long distance and cross border transportation of food, but it also makes Namibia more independent and improves its resilience to feed the nation in the long run. What inclusive innovations are you aware of that we need now more than ever to remove inequalities? Please share them in the chat window. Over to my colleague Yvonne, who will start to share a few inclusive innovation stories that we have collected. That's right. Now we know what inclusive innovation is all about. Let's listen to some of the entrepreneurs we've been supporting to realize their ideas. Meet Jane, CEO and founder of Greenbelt Energy, which focuses on making an impact in the energy sector by providing renewable natural gas as an alternative to charcoal and firewood in Zambia. They have designed a low emission clean cookstove equipped with sensors for safety and efficiency and are currently working with women and youth to create an inclusive bioenergy ecosystem that uses waste to generate and sell green energy. Do you know what energy source was used to produce your food? Well, in Zambia, 70% of our population are dependent on charcoal and firewood for cooking. This results to environmental degradation, energy poverty, and according to the World Health Organization, is associated with 2 million deaths every year. Now our solution as Greenbelt Energy is to produce biogas from outgrow source animal manure as a safe cooking gas. Our products include the biogas, a smart renewable natural gas cook stove that we've developed with the National Technology Business Center patent pending. Our target markets are low and middle income households. And our, our business model involves the production of the gas from the animal manure, which is then processed in the bio plant and reaches the customer either through direct sales agents or through our partners. Meet Tariro, an architecture student that is deeply interested in innovation and improving the livelihood of shark dwellers by innovating with them on how to benefit from their natural surroundings without damaging it. They do this by empowering the shark dwellers to teach their communities and guide them as they become entrepreneurs. This is due to the people migrating from rural areas to urban areas for a better form of living. But instead, they met with poor living conditions. Small corrugated rooms that house up to five individuals that heat up in the summer and get extremely cold in the winter, communal toilets with zero privacy, and cooking that needs to be done outside the same rooms that easily catch fire. These are the subhuman conditions living permaculture plans on improving. As living permaculture, our aim is to improve the living conditions of these individuals by innovating with them on how to benefit from their natural surroundings without damaging it, empowering them to teach their communities and guiding them as they become entrepreneurs with the knowledge they acquire. Our projects include insulation in the shacks to prevent them from getting too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter, 
a rocket stove and solar cooker that improve the mode of cooking making it safer, a water filter to aid with better use of water, a dry toilet that can be owned by each individual family and provides privacy, but most importantly, we innovate with individuals on how to acquire food from the environment. The planting of fruit and vegetables around their shacks is an essential part of our project as we not only innovate with them to provide food for their families, but we empower them to commercialize the access. A team is best fit for the project as we work with organizations such as the Namibian Housing Group and the Shack Dwellers Federation. We have worked with a large number of shack dwellers with more individuals showing interest. We have worked extensively with 74 individuals. We are looking for innovators to help us innovate with the community. Living permaculture. Let's redesign our home spaces and lives to function more like an ecosystem. Both Jane and Tariro took part in the training and supporting program that Bob Inc. and SIES delivered and both mentioned how important this program was for them. It helped them access new knowledge, best practice, connect them with peers, and tap into networks of inventors and other stakeholders that SAIS and Bob Inc. can offer to them. Thanks for sharing those exciting stories, Yvonne. Inclusive innovation is still a rather new approach, but it's rapidly developing as it gets more attention. We see more and more examples of inclusive innovators, such as the ones we've just showcased, which is great because to reach that scale, 4 billion consumers living at the base of the income pyramid, we need new entrepreneurial strategies. As mentioned before, there's a huge business opportunity for the private sector to serve that largely untapped BOP market. And more than a business opportunity, this is a chance to combine profit and impact and it is an opportunity, not only for bigger companies, but those at all sizes, from startups to SMEs and multinationals. Some companies that have been around for a long time might adapt their existing offerings to make them affordable for low income consumers. Newcomers such as startups are capable of coming up with just entirely new and creative offerings. So if you work for a company, regardless of its size, Inclusive innovation provides a business opportunity for you. Now that we've talked about the opportunity, how do we grasp this, you may ask, especially since venturing into the base of the pyramid can be risky, since there is a lot less known and certain when operating in these new markets. Over the past decade, we've started to learn so much more about how to make inclusive innovation work Let's share some insights, starting with tips for inclusive innovators. Are you an inclusive innovator or do you want to become one? At Bob Inc, we often use five principles that our partners should consider. It's impact, desirability, feasibility, viability, and suitability. Let's unfold each one of them. It all starts with having the right DNA in your team. As you will be exploring new territories, you need an optimistic attitude with capabilities to work agile, be collaborative, and to empathize with the low income consumers you serve. That brings us to desirability. It is important that inclusive innovators see their consumers as individuals with aspirations and a willingness to pay for a great product or service. Don't see them as beneficiaries that want a solution that you just think is good for them. And then viability. Well, a business that lacks a revenue model cannot sustain itself and grow. While public grants are great, they're not a revenue model. Impact speaks for itself and so does feasibility. If you're working on an inclusive innovation yourself, how many of these five success factors can you take? When you have these resources and power to support inclusive innovators, there's a lot you can do as well. Are you working for an innovation support organization such as a tech hub, investment company, or NGO? How can you support inclusive innovators in your geography or sector? Let us recommend three areas of support to you. Help improve access to knowledge, networks, and access to finance. 
I will not elaborate on this right now because you can read them in a publication that we will be announcing shortly. But we still want to leave you with a general thought right now. The support that's currently provided to inclusive innovators is often fragmented with entrepreneurs hopping from one program or network to another. We believe we need more collaborations and sustainable networks that provide continuity to help entrepreneurs accelerate from one stage in their business to the next. We were inspired, for example, by how the SIS2 program brokered a collaboration between many support networks in the Southern African region. We are also inspired by VC4A that has been successful in running an online startup community for more than 10 years, with over 10,000 registered startups, including many inclusive innovators. So let's make sure we build on each other's knowledge, exchange learnings, and connect our networks to give inclusive innovators the best possible support. Only then can we make inclusive innovation a mainstream approach. To close this session, we want to practice what we preached and therefore present our recommendations for those that train people on inclusive innovation. The size 2 program and Bob Inc. took time to reflect on our own training activities and we wrote down the eight biggest things that we have learned about how to effectively support this group of inclusive innovators. For example, recommendation Number one would be know what you want to achieve, but be flexible. Every program has its own goals and designs the training approach accordingly. That's great, of course, but you wouldn't want to see set this in stone right from the start. We realized that we had to be willing to adapt our approach based on feedback that we were getting from participants as they went through our course. A fourth recommendation, for example, would be using self-assessment exercises to defeat inventor bias. Because when you're working on the same inclusive innovation ID for months or even years, there's a risk of tunnel vision. And as you're busy working out those little details of your innovation, you might miss the big picture. That's why we encourage entrepreneurs to take a step back every now and then and assess that bigger picture. Assessment sheets and coaches can help. Another recommendation is to make training content open source so that others can reuse it. Let's say people want to develop a training curriculum on the inclusive innovation topic. Where would they start collecting content? There's so much developed, yet so little available publicly. That's why we've decided to make our materials open source under a Creative Commons license. A few participants in our training course, such as Incu an incubator, has already adapted our content to optimize it for their own curriculum. And we expect to see a lot more of these alterations. You can download our publication on the SIS2 program website to get a fuller understanding of where our eight recommendations come from. Thanks for joining our session today. We hope you will remember the base of the pyramid and the exciting opportunity for making inclusive innovation a mainstream approach. Let's give a big hand to all those hardworking inclusive innovators working to address the challenges of today, also with COVID and tomorrow. Reach out to us if you want to continue this conversation. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Great, thank you for listening in to our session. So to dive deeper into the first question, which is how can we really make money on inclusive innovation? And one thing we'd like to highlight is, uh, especially when you are targeting the BOP consumers, understanding what they're willing to pay for as a product or a service can already tell you how much they're ready to spend and the viability of your business model. 
A good example will come from a work we've already done with Global Distributors Collective, which is a collective of last mile distributors of off-grid solar products and clean cooking solutions within sub-Saharan Africa, who have a wide range of membership from small to big industry players. If we look at the membership and dive deeper into how their business is viability, we can see that those that are registered between five to 10 years have actually a turnover of over 100 to 500 K USD annually, which is a good indication that actually inclusive innovation is viable. Thanks, uh, Yvonne. I think I can uh, take the next question that we've seen. Thanks um, everyone for all the good questions that you're raising and please keep them coming. We have more than enough time to answer uh, your questions. Um, so there was a question about uh, examples of how universities and companies can work together to support more inclusive innovation. Um, I think that's a great idea in itself because I think both stakeholders or communities provide something different. So where uh, universities are places that educate uh, the future generation of entrepreneurs and inclusive innovators. I think the companies can really bring in um, real world problems that these students can solve. So I think we've seen quite some good examples in the size program itself um, with um, projects initiated, for example, by Botswana University, bringing both worlds together. So um, students being matched with companies that have problems to solve, and then the students bring in all their creativity, uh, working in teams to solve and prototype these problems. We've also seen this with a, um, a project led by Dololo in uh, Namibia that um, even started an earlier stage uh, developing um, educational materials for kids in primary school to already uh, prepare them for um, becoming that next generation of inclusive innovators. Um, and again, bringing in that link of real problems and opportunities <laughs> that companies in the country like to work on. Um, so an outside uh, size, we see a lot of examples as well. So I think Yvonne, you're not far away from some of the bigger incubators in Kenya. Uh, for example, the C4D lab that is hosted by the University of Nairobi. And uh, yeah, we see more and more companies also investing in these kind of um, university uh, hosted uh, startup communities. And there's, for example, the Safaricom Lab in, um, in Kenya, hosted by Strathmore uh, University, where Safaricom is really putting in money and resources to tap into that creative potential of students to help Safaricom as a big telco to find uh, new solutions to better serve um, their mobile phone customers. Yvonne, do you wanna take the next one? Yes. And the next question is on uh, if governments should take more responsibility to serve the base of the pyramid. This is an interesting question that uh, can focus also a bit on policy. But uh, one thing I would like to highlight that is that inclusive innovation brings in a more socially um, inclusive and equitable understanding of innovation uh, with a particular focus not only on the growth or, but reducing inequalities and aligning this with the, with the recent interest in inequalities that we see that are not only ethical but also important to economical and social cohesion between various sectors within our countries and also between different countries within our regions. Um, a good example I can give from my region is uh, a funding that was given by the World Bank together with the Kenyan government. This was during the global off-grid uh, solar program that was hosted in Kenya earlier this year where the 15 billion fund was committed to the off-grid sector. And this is to achieve the universal access to electrification by 2030 in 14 countries of Kenya. And this was to focus on the marginalized communities in this area. So this is a good example of how the government has taken responsibility to cooperate together with the base of the pyramid to ensure there's electrification in the country. Um, would you have another good example, Gawain? 
Um, well, I see that there's a, a question raised that's quite similar. It's not so much about the government, but about non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and the role that they can play to drive inclusive innovation. And I think, I mean, we need both. Um, and the good thing is that we see a lot of governments, but also NGOs, uh, showing a lot more interest in um, how they can involve the private sector in large programs. Um, so um, the agenda having shifted uh, from aid to trade. So how can we make sure we reach the sustainable development goals by working with uh, businesses that have uh, solutions that can really scale and sustain? So instead of going into a two-year program to make sure 100,000 people get access to the solar panels, largely subsidized by governments or NGOs. It's all about how can we find that entrepreneur that can help us reach these, this group, not just in our program, but also after the program and service uh, this group of uh, consumers. So I think for all the inclusive innovators and entrepreneurs um, in this call, I think the, the opportunity is getting bigger for you to, to connect with these larger programs and, and, and use them as a vehicle to, uh, to get your products and services to market. Thanks, Karen. And I can see another question coming in, and this is touching on the online course that we had with the size, uh, within the size program. Uh, so the question is, can we still register for the online course on inclusive innovation? And if I can answer that, I will say yes. The course is still running until end of the year, and anyone can register, any entrepreneur uh, from any region who is interested in inclusive innovation are welcome to participate on the course that is on the VC4A platform. Uh, the link will be shared and has been dropped in the chat. Um, shall I take that one, Yvonne? Yes, and it's actually uh, something yeah. to about those, those eight learnings that we have um, collected as we're wrapping up our collaboration with the SIZE program. Um, it's all learnings about how to effectively train inclusive innovators or aspiring inclusive innovators. Um, and yeah, we're very proud that we actually published the publication on the SIZE website uh, yesterday. Uh, so I hope that Sharon could be kind again to drop that link in the chat. So you can go there straight away and download the publication as a, as a PDF. Um, and I'd just like to add that we really look forward to hearing from you after you've been going through that publication because the whole purpose of us uh, for us to to write down these learnings was to start this conversation about how different programs training that same group of entrepreneurs on inclusive innovation can better work together or exchange learning so yeah do reach out to us uh, i think our email addresses are in the publication so do reach out if you want to continue that conversation do you want to go uh, yvonne yes i see Good the question, question. Yeah. coming in so the question is about the three points that we have learned about marketing especially in the bop markets um, and uh, just to highlight this again, uh, this is also linking to the question on the online course that uh, is on the VC4A platform where we have introduced a model that we as BOP Inc. have been able to work with in the various markets that we operate in. We call it the ATIA model, uh, which is used for BOP market, which is quite replicable and uh, can be used with various products and services. Um, so that is uh, one key point that I can uh, mention, especially when you are marketing for the BOP markets. And uh, one also key thing to note is that uh, it's always never a one size fits all. It uh, definitely has to be tailored to the various markets and especially to the consumers that we are targeting, which will be the BOPs. Mm, have I missed anything, Harwin? Or would you want to add to that? Uh, I think that was uh, was spot on. I'm not sure if you can give an example to showcase that ATR model. 
Yes, a good example is uh, it can be examples that we can bring in from various projects that we've done with. So we were actually taking a product to market which was in Kenya. It was a cassava flour in Kenya. And how we got uh, the attention of the consumers, which is the first A on their tier model, was using Wi-Fi, a digital platform on the local tra transport that we call the Matatus. So it was very interesting where consumers will hop into a bus and would see, uh, they would log into the Wi-Fi that is free on the Matatus and they would actually see the product being advertised and where they can get it and the benefits and how they can use it for various cooking uh, purposes within the household which was uh, quite an interesting way. And we were able to capture quite a number of uh, consumers using that particular method. Um, and on the trust uh, method, Karen, do you have a very good example, especially with the work you did previously? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's definitely one of the uh, key points that I would add to the top three. It's all about building trust. So we've learned that I mean, for B2B consumers, when you have very little cash to spend, I mean, you tend to be very risk averse. So you'd only invest that little money in products or services that you can really trust. And I think a big trust uh, driver is to leverage um, other people in the community, particularly those that have an authority. So in the case of, selling, for example, new kind of fertilizers or seeds to smaller farmers. And often practiced uh, approach is to work with lead farmers. So those that have a good reputation in the village or maybe a, a larger commercial farm, if you can get them to use um, the fertilizer first and the smaller farmers see that it's really a beneficial product and a good, uh, they get good value uh, for money out of it, then that will help you to go to this uh, larger group of consumers that uh, in the end you want to sell to. So trust generation is, is very important. Uh, it also has to do with giving people an experience. So I think, um, yeah, staying with the example of the off-grid lighting industry, a much um, practiced consumer finance model nowadays is, is pay as you go which allows people to uh, buy a product on credit and pay very small installments, uh, basically the same that they pay on uh, a kerosene lamp, uh, for example. And for a lot of consumers, not having to pay a full amount or a very big deposit upfront allows them to get the experience of using the product and then pay off the product uh, as they use it. Um, so there are a lot of different strategies and often very specific to the kind of product that you can use to generate trust. I think maybe this is also a nice opportunity to uh, steer you towards our online course. Um, we said it's still available and I think this is module two of the online course, um, which is all about how do you develop a compelling value proposition for BOP consumers. Or of course, another question, right Yvonne? Yes. Uh, and that I think it should be coming in. Um, and the last question talks about if the subject of inclusive innovation falls under the social umbrella. And I think this is a question that we have tackled together with the first one on how have we actually been able to do this as a government responsibility or within the private sector. And I think you answered it quite effectively. Um, and I think another important question that has come up is how is inclusive innovation funded? Um, and I think, uh, Garwin, you would be better placed to respond to this question, especially focusing on the size program as a good example. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I think it depends, really depends on what stage you're in as an inclusive innovator. I think most inclusive innovators start with the little money that they have available themselves or just use their own time to first work on the first ID. But I think as soon as, I mean, your ID gets materialized and you want to invest in producing maybe some of your first prototypes and doing a good pilot to showcase that um, your consumers actually want it and they're happy using it, that's when you probably need your first uh, funds 
And uh, as mentioned before, there are a lot of great um, uh, programs out there nowadays um, backed by, by donors, government donors, um, implemented by NGOs that you can link up with. A lot of great innovation challenges that are out there. In the size program and the grant that they uh, grant program they have was a really nice opportunity. Um, so it's really uh, helpful to keep an eye on that as an inclusive innovator. Um, and again, to give you uh, a very concrete tip would be to register register yourself on the VC4A uh, platform because um, that's where you can keep track of new funding opportunities um, that are available for uh, startups. And then I think as you go further than being a startup and you want to scale up your business, I think it becomes quite trickier because we do see that in a lot of sectors there's still an investment gap. Um, while the market opportunity is so big as we talked about today, I mean, there's still not enough um, money available, uh, private capital, growth capital available to finance that. But this, this sector is growing, so there, as the attention grows for the opportunity of inclusive innovation, more investment companies are also looking to invest there. Um, a lot of angel investors um, you might want to reach out to. Um, but um, yeah, so different kind of financing at different kind of stages of your, uh, of your journey. Thank you for your response, Karin. And that was uh, quite conclusive and uh, quite comprehensive as well. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I hope that we have shared enough on inclusive innovation. And just like uh, Garin had mentioned, we have put our email addresses in case you'd want to reach out to us. And uh, please uh, get or grab yourself a, a copy of the publication. Uh, go to the link that we shared, look at the recommendations on how to build inclusive innovation. And we wish you a successful journey in that. And we hope that the recommendations will be helpful to you and your partners within your organization. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And have a good day. Have a good day, too.